Eagles Entertainment. Eagle Eye in the Sky is fueled by Gatorade, the official sports drink of the Philadelphia Eagles. Everything that move, I don't care who it is. Let's go. Give me everything you got. Play fast, play hard. Let's beat these boys tonight in their house. Go. It's party time. It's party time. Let's go. You are listening to the Eagle Eye in the Sky podcast. Now here's your host, Brand Duffy. That's right of the week, and we're talking about a couple more of the Eagles draft picks today as the Eagle Eye in the Sky podcast, fueled by Gatorade, continues. I'm Fran Duffy, and as always, I think we've got a great show for you here on episode number 334. At the top of this week's show, we've got Chalk Talk, where I chat with a couple of head coaches that have worked with some of the newest Eagles over the last couple of seasons. First up, we're going to hear from Texas Tech head coach Matt Wells, who worked with the Eagles' fourth-round draft choice, Zach McPherson, down with the Red Raiders. And we talk about Zach's athletic background, his personality, his family, and what that means for him transitioning to the NFL. Next up, from Tulane, we've got Willie Fritz, who I caught up with to talk about Eagles' seventh-round draft choice, Patrick Johnson, and the impact he made on that Green Wave team over the last few seasons. So we've got two fun interviews about two of the newest Eagles defensive players today. But before we get there, a couple of quick things I want to make sure we hit on. First up, I'm going to ask you guys once again to head on over to our Apple Podcast page and throw us your support with a rating and a comment. If you've got a question, if you've got a request, this could be about anything at this point, whether it's about the Eagles or about the, the NFL in general, about the game. Now's the time. Jump on. Let me know. Just leave your request in the comment section, and I will fulfill that request in the next couple of episodes. Also, we'll be continuing our reactions to the 2021 NFL Draft over on the Journey to the Draft podcast, where last week, last Thursday, one of my favorite episodes of the year dropped. Our Journey series where we started to go back and look at all the analysis we've got on Devontae Smith before he got here to become a a member of the Philadelphia Eagles. We dropped that episode last Thursday. This week, we've got the episode that features Landon Dickerson and Milton Williams, the Eagles' two day two selections. So you can make sure you go check that out on the Journey to the Draft podcast, wherever podcasts can be found. It's a really fun look at the paths for all three of those players from college all the way up to the NFL. All right, enough about Journey. Let's get this episode of the Eagle Eye in the Sky rolling. It's time to dive into our chat with both Willie Fritz and Matt Wells in Chalk Talk. Let's get down to business. It's time for Chalk Talk. Well, excited to welcome in the head coach at Tulane, Mr. Willie Fritz. Coach, thanks so much for joining us to talk about Eagles seventh-round draft choice Patrick Johnson and and share what you feel he's going to bring to Philadelphia both on and off the field. Well, I'm I'm very excited for Patrick and his family. He's an awesome young man. Man, The the people of Philadelphia are going to love him. He was with me for four years. I never had any issues with him. You always, you have what you call a, a list that you, you know, a guy misses breakfast or lunch or class or an assignment or, you know, late to a meeting or weightlifting session. There's a lot of things that collegiate student athletes have to do. And he was never on it for four years. Just a, just a great young man, great person, and one heck of a football player. So, Coach, you get hired there in 2016. His freshman year was 2017. So I got to think he was part of that first full-year recruiting class that you had, right? At at what point did you realize that he was going to be a special talent for you, uh, you know, whether it was in the recruiting process or after he got to campus? You you know, we didn't get on him until late. You know, he's from uh, Chattanooga, Tennessee. You know, someone – well, Patrick told me this yesterday. He called me. He said last Eagles draft pick from Chattanooga was a pretty decent player named Reggie White. Is that right? I believe so. Yes. <laughs> uh, so Patrick, uh, we got on him kind of late. Uh, didn't really have any Division One offers. Had a lot of FCS, one AA offers. Uh, he was a good, very good tight end in high school, along with being a great defensive end. A little bit more of a hand in the ground defensive end and a three point stance. Uh, we got him in, and, and uh, you know this was kind of a rebuild type program. Here at Tulane, so we had a lot of true freshmen who were able to come in and play for us. And Patrick actually started some as a true freshman. He played against Ohio State and Oklahoma and some teams like that, and you know, and was really playing inside, you know, against uh, offensive guards and tackles. His last couple of years, we moved him to the outside edge of, uh, of offensive tackles, inside uh, half of the tight end, and he just did an excellent job as an edge rusher. He's the all-time leading sack leader in school history. Uh, you know, he has a knack for using his hands and, and feet and 
in conjunction with each other and timing up his hand strike on the offensive lineman. Uh, you know, then we started dropping them into space a little bit. We started playing in underneath, you know, in a, a you know, a two, two shell look, a, a three deep type look, uh, running with the back out of the backfield. We even matched him up on, on guys out on the perimeter. So he's an excellent athlete. Uh, I think, uh, his, uh, Pro day measurables were just incredible. I think he ran a four five three, you know, at two hundred around two hundred fifty pounds. So uh, I'm looking forward for, for Eagle fans to see what he can do. I also think he's going to be good in the kicking game. Mm. You know, he played. I didn't play him as much in the kicking game because he played almost every snap for us on defense. But he'll be able to play on the punt, punt return, kickoff, uh, kickoff return. He could be a tight end wing on extra point field goals. So just a great all around player. Coach, I was really glad that you brought up you know, what he was able to do for you guys moving in reverse, playing in coverage, because uh, you know, I think a lot of Eagles fans say, hey, all-time leading sack artist, this is a guy that can get after the quarterback. The Eagles announce him as a linebacker, so they think of it as a position switch, but it's something that you guys had him doing in your various zone concepts. Yeah, I'd sometimes get upset when we dropped him too much. <laughs> get his ears back and go, but uh, you know, and, and sometimes he had to, you know, match the number three person in the offensive set. And, you know, he's a smart football player. Uh, you know, I, I, I just think the Eagles got a steal. You know, uh, Patrick's pumped about, uh, you know, all he's been saying is fly, Eagles, fly. <laughs> but uh, I was, uh, you know, just a little bit frustrated because I thought he would have been picked a lot earlier. But it doesn't matter where you get picked. It's uh, how you end up. And I think he's got an opportunity to have a great career there in Philadelphia. Coach, when you talk about pass rushers, you know, at his size, 6'2", uh, you know, you mentioned around 250 pounds, uh, a little bit on the smaller end. Would you have a guy that had that level of production? I think it speaks to, you know, a guy that just has a knack for getting after the quarterback. He's never behind the, the passer. He's always found a way to get from A to B. What was that development like for him? And how did you see him grow in terms of being able to win with his hands at the top of the rush and be able to string moves together and get home for a sack? Yeah, you know, I had a couple of really good – he worked with a couple of great defensive line coaches. Uh, Kevin Peoples, he had his first three years. He's now the defensive line coach at Indiana. And then Byron Dawson, uh, Coach Patrick, this last year. And both of them did a sensational job of, uh, you know, teaching them pro techniques. Uh, we've got, a, you know, access to this pro team here in town uh, that, that we, we get to talk to – a lot of their players, a lot of their players come over here and work out. I've got some guys in the NFL that play on the defensive line that come back and train here at Tulane. I know they work with Patrick quite a bit. Uh, so it just, you know, he got, got a spin move in his arsenal that he picked up here the last couple of years. But it's just that strike timing with his hands on the hands of the offensive tackle that he was just so good at. Uh, you know, and, and he – he almost probably had another 10 sacks in his career. You know, he had the guy, you know, within his clutches. Uh, you know, it's hard to get a sack in collegiate football. It's hard to get a sack in the NFL. You know, those, those quarterbacks do a nice job having that internal clock and getting rid of the ball just a split second before you arrive. Uh, but he's certainly put pressure on guys. You know, his whole career is also excellent against the run. You know, fullbacks kicking him out guards pulling him and kicking him out. You know, we call it hard jointing a guy where you're near foot, near shoulder, near arm, or, 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 you know, making that hole as small as a phone booth, wrong shoulder and guys blowing it up, not giving a running lane for the running back. So, you know, he's not just a one dimensional guy who's good, you know, against uh, when the guy uh, pass sets on him, he, he's great against all run plays too. I think, Coach, the last question I've got for you is just uh, about Patrick as a leader and what he was what he was like in the locker room with those guys. What did you see from him in terms of uh, his ability to be able to rally the troops and uh, get everybody going defensively? Well, he, he's a great young man. I just, you know, here at Tulane, we got to have true student athletes here. You know, it's, it's a hard school to get into. Uh, he's already graduated, you know, so we're proud of him being able to do that in three and a half years. Uh, you know, but he's just a guy that everybody listened to. He's always in a good mood. Uh, I always tell my coaches, find guys that have had a great 18 years, you know, because we'll do a great job with them. You know, if they've had a tough 18 years, it's hard to get them to you know, turn in the right direction. But uh, his parents did an awesome job with him. And, 
And, uh, you know, I can't say enough great things about him. He's, a, he's an awesome young man. Well, Coach Fritch, thanks so much for joining us here and sharing some more information about Patrick Johnson. Stay safe, stay healthy. Best of luck for you guys this season. You betcha. Thank you. Roll wave. Introducing Season 2 of the Return Game Podcast, Birds, Boys, and Bad Blood, presented by NovaCare Rehabilitation. When it comes to the Eagles-Cowboys rivalry, you think you know the whole story, but there is more. So, so much more, and we're about to uncover it all. And I think back to some of my favorite memories in the rivalry, and I remember exactly where I was who I was with, what I was doing for so many of these games. Lito Shepard's interception to ruin T.O.'s return to Philly. I remember leaping off the couch in my house where I grew up and nearly punching the ceiling. I jumped so high. The pickle juice game. I was actually on a family vacation in Disney World. We made sure we were back at our hotel so that we did not miss that game. 44-6. to I remember I was watching that game from a bar near the mall where I was finishing up Christmas shopping. Earlier that day, I was with one of my best friends. Obviously, we couldn't miss the game, so we made sure we were geared up. We had a good spot in front of a big screen. We went through like 18 plates of appetizers that day. And I have these memories because these games meant so much and continue to mean so much to us as Eagles fans. So if you want to relish some of those great moments in the rivalry, be sure to go subscribe to Return Game and Eagles Entertainment original podcast. Subscribe now wherever you listen to podcasts. Well, excited to be joined here with Texas Tech head coach Matt Wells. Coach, thanks so much for joining us here uh, on PhiladelphiaEagles.com to talk about Eagles' fourth-round pick, Zach McPherson. Yeah, I appreciate you having me on. So let's talk about Zach because this is a player that arrived there uh, in college in, uh, at Texas Tech at the same time that you did, just about when you came over uh, as the head coach. What was it like kind of installing him as a starter from day one? He was a career backup uh, here locally with us in Penn State. Uh, what was it like? What were your first interactions with Zach? Yeah, first of all, uh, McPherson family and I go way back. Coached his brother Emmanuel at uh, New Mexico probably 10 years ago. Um, and so had familiarity with the family, uh, helped in the recruiting process. Zach chose us over a couple other Big 12 schools. Um, hadn't really gotten on the field much at uh, Penn State. Be honest with you, limited video. Mm. Um, but uh, knew what kind of person he was, what kind of family he came from. Tremendous people, um, tremendous, uh, I know, parents and upbringing. So uh, getting Zach in here was good right out of the gate. Uh, he did a great job of really buying into what we were doing here on the field as well as in the weight room. He changed a bunch over two years. I mean, he developed himself. Um, his skill development got better, to be real frank with you. He played his best ball his second year. I think it's also kind of testifies to, to guys that are grad transferring like Zach, that have two years, and they can uh, go through an offseason and, um, and have a better second year, and Zach certainly did that and I think took advantage of his opportunity, and, and uh, the Eagles have recognized that. A lot of other NFL teams did, and he did well in his pro day, so I uh, look forward to seeing what he's got, uh, you know, the next opportunity. Coach, it's so interesting you talk about the previous relationship you had uh, with his family. I feel like that's been a theme, both college and in the NFL, over the last year with the pandemic has been uh, how important those previous relationships are because the lack of exposures with players, uh, whether it's with recruiting or whether it's with the draft, free agency uh, here in the NFL, uh, just, I mean, you, you kind of spoke to it already, how important that previous relationship was with him and his family. Yeah, great, great point. Maybe the best point that we'll make on this whole interview, to be honest with you, um, because through the pandemic, um, this is how we interacted with scouts, yeah. you know, um, personnel guys in the NFL. And we did here at Texas Tech, we did a monthly Zoom uh, with, a, uh, you know, representatives from almost every team and just updated them. Um, so with limited scouting ability, limited in-person um, evaluations in college and in the pros, I do think we all revert back to um, relationships. We revert back to coaches that we trust, high school coaches that we trust, other college coaches. I, I would say the same probably um, in the NFL. And, and uh, you go back to previous relationships. Um, Sean, your head scout there, did a tremendous job, always does here in Lubbock um, and with us, with Dave Scholes, my strength coach, and I. And I just think um, – in times like this, I do think that stuff like that does matter. So it's a great point by you.
Yeah, Sean Heinland uh, has been down in that area uh, for a long time. He's joined me on the Journey to the Draft podcast uh, multiple times. Coach, uh, when you get Zach on campus and you talked about, you know, just kind of hadn't played a ton, what were some of the traits that allowed him to, to find early success as he was still trying to hone in on that, uh, that cornerback skill, as you referred to? Yeah, I think before he honed in, just in, in terms of his, um, his footwork and his technique, um, and really changed in the weight room and bought into nutrition and, and our strength training was, I think the first thing was confidence. Mm. He's a confident young man. That's a confident family. Um, he's been playing ball, multiple sports for a long time. It's kind of ingrained in him. So I think the confidence thing that he came in, and first of all, you better have that yep. at corner, as we all know. But I think the confidence is what allowed him to play early on. Yes, he was talented, and yes, he had good athletic ability, but he really improved from his junior to his senior year quite a bit. Mm. And to me, like the when you talk about his athletic background, and uh, you mentioned that the confidence there, uh, playing corner. I mean, it's it's a lot. I mean, you got to deal with with failure uh, sometimes, especially uh, in that league. I mean, it's a passing league, as everybody knows. Uh, you're going to give up some big plays, but then you also have uh, Zach, who has that ability to take the ball away as well. Uh, were there cases where you saw, like, yeah? He's going to get beat one drive, and he's going to come back, and he's going to be able to make that play. He's not going to go in the tank after giving up a play. Yeah, I certainly think in this league, in the Big 12, every Saturday you go up against an elite wideout, um, an elite quarterback, and there's always a really good play caller too. Mm -hmm. And so I think he's challenged every corner in this, uh, in this league, in the Big 12, is challenged every Saturday. Um, to have the confidence is important. To have a short memory is very important. Uh, learn from it and move on, and I think Zach displays all those characteristics. Yeah, I think that baseball background certainly comes in handy uh, oh. there as well uh, with all the failure that you deal with playing baseball. Coach, the, the last uh, part I wanted to bring up to you too as well, with Zach, that kind of stood out to me, you, you, number one, the, the position versatility, uh, but then two, with RPOs, the quick slants, the, the glance routes, the corners, the DBs have to be able to tackle uh, in today's NFL now too. Uh, what did you see from Zach uh, in that arena coming forward towards the line of scrimmage? Yeah, he, he does have, he's got versatility. You know, we played him in the slot. We played him as a, you know, some people are calling it the nickel corner over the slot receiver. That's a position here um, in the big 12 that you see in the NFL more and more um, guys in the NFL, the slot, quick, fast receivers. He can play that position. He's uh, I think he's more than a willing tackler. He's an effective tackler. Um, it's not, you don't say that much about corners, but um Zach is, uh, he is very effective. He can go right through the hip. He, uh, he does a nice job with tackling and, um, you know, facing all the RPOs and that kind of, um, you know, philosophy in the Big 12, which is becoming more prevalent. I know in the NFL, uh, I think it would be an advantage to him as well. Well, Coach, you've been so generous with your time. Thanks so much for joining us and shedding some light into Zach McPherson and how he's going to make that transition here to Philadelphia. Best of luck through the rest of spring. Best of luck to you guys here in the fall. Stay safe, stay healthy. We'll talk to you soon. Okay, thanks for having me on. Great stuff there from both Coach Wells and Coach Fritch, who you can follow on Twitter just like I do. And while you're at it, I'm at EaglesXOs. That's where I post all the podcasts I'm a part of and all of our X's and O's content that we produce here with the Eagles Entertainment. And you know how much I appreciate everyone that promotes this podcast on social media. That is one way to support the show. But the best way is to go on Apple Podcasts or Stitcher, leave us a rating, and leave us a comment. I wanted to give a shout-out today to someone who did exactly that. First up. GDJX left a five-star review saying how much they enjoy the show and how it features a deeper look at the game and it's you know different than your typical sports talk radio. Well, GD, thanks so much. And, and that's exactly what we're going for. I appreciate the review. Thank you for the review and thank you for listening. Before we wrap the show up, just want to kind of touch on a couple of the transactions the Eagles have made over the last couple of weeks, really. I will start here with Kerryon Johnson. We haven't talked about Kerryon here on the episode. I was a big fan of Kerryon Johnson when he was coming out of Auburn a couple of years ago. Uh, to me, this is a player that could be a grinder, has the ability to be a feature back in any given game because that's his skill set. He's got that ability to tote the rock between the tackles. He's also a three-down player. He's not an electric athlete. He's certainly not as dynamic as Miles Sanders, but this is a guy who catches the ball very, very well. He's also excellent in pass protection. I've got a film room breakdown really on all of these players, but another one on Carryon Johnson. Keep an eye on that here in the coming days and weeks over on PhiladelphiaEagles.com and all of the Eagles social channels. Uh, I was a big fan of Carry on coming out. I really like the addition here to this Eagles backfield. Uh, let's stay on the defense, or let's go to the defensive side of the football. 
I really like the addition of Ryan Kerrigan as well. And I think when you look at what he can be almost as a force multiplier for the young players the Eagles have on their team. Chris Long, uh, former Eagles defensive end, he actually made a great point on his podcast. Not that, not that that's a surprise. Made a great point about Ryan Kerrigan. He said, look, you know, Brandon Graham is obviously a very important veteran presence on that Eagles defensive line group, right? But BG, while he can teach those young guys, his body type is so unique that it's tough for those guys to be able to mirror that, to be able to match that with what he does. And all defensive linemen, all pass rushers are built a little bit differently, as Chris talked about here when he came on the show earlier this offseason. But Ryan Kerrigan has a little bit more of a traditional body type. So for younger guys like a Derek Barnett and a Josh Sweat, some of the other young pass rushers on that roster, they've got the ability to learn from another guy who's got almost 100 career sacks uh, over the course of his time in the NFL. Ryan Kerrigan is going to be an important part, just to, not just as a mentor, because don't let me downplay the fact that he can still get after the quarterback. He can win with power. He can push the pocket. He can defend the run. He's a versatile player still at this, uh, at this stage of his career. So I'm really, really excited about that addition to the defensive front. Then you go over to the secondary, the Eagles trade for Josiah Scott. Scott, who I think is an intriguing developmental player. Uh, this is a guy who was a fourth-round pick a year ago coming out of Michigan State. Uh, new defensive scheme, new, uh, new, new front office, complete regime change down there in Jacksonville. So he obviously uh, you know, gets, gets lost in the shuffle, gets traded here uh, to the Philadelphia Eagles. And this is a player that, you know, when I watched him, he was a three-year starter at Michigan State, and he actually started more games as a true freshman than anybody uh, under Mark D'Antonio, who was there for a long, long time out there with the Spartans of Michigan State. So I think that speaks to his football character. He's known as an A-plus human being. Uh, obviously, I think that when you look at the, this acquisition for the Eagles, a lot of this will be based off the college report, right? So whether you're talking about the Eagles decision makers or as well, the defensive coaching staff, whether you're looking at the defensive backs coach or the defensive coordinator, everybody viewing this kid coming out, and you say, all right, well, look, he had a limited sample size a year ago. He didn't play a ton down in Jacksonville this year, but a fourth-round pick who was a backup sub-package player, uh, he went in after DJ Hayden kind of got hurt for a few weeks in the second half of the season, so you got to see him be the full-time nickel corner. But that was the, for his first time playing inside in the slot full-time. He was an outside corner during his time in college. So uh, this is a guy who's still, I think the arrow was kind of pointing up. He was an undersized player who a lot of people felt would need to slide inside in the NFL, but he's got tools. He's got the character. I'm excited about that addition and just see how he fits in in the secondary. It was a, a cheap price to pay. Uh, I'm excited to see ultimately how he fits in. But just a couple of the, the big transactions here over the last couple of weeks since the, the end of the draft. The Eagles also uh, brought in Lareven Clark, uh, who is a, a proven swing tackle former rim round pick out of Texas Tech, actually. Um, and I think that this is a player that he's got good size. He always had good traits, and he proved that he could be a nice, formidable backup tackle uh, in the NFL. Coming off an injury, so we'll see where he's at from that standpoint. Uh, but this is a guy who can who can factor into the rotation here along the offensive line. So uh, a couple of additions here to this Eagles team. Thanks so much for everybody uh, for tuning in once again to the Eagle Eye in the Sky podcast fueled by Gatorade. I'll be back here next week, breaking down uh, more, hopefully have a couple more interviews here uh, with some of these college coaches on the Eagles draft pick. Stay tuned for that right here on the Eagle Eye in the Sky podcast fueled by Gatorade. For everybody here at the Duffy House, I am Fran Duffy. We will talk to you next week. The Philadelphia Eagles are now on Google Home and Amazon Alexa devices. Want to hear Merrill Reese before the season gets underway? Simply say, hey Google, talk to Philadelphia Eagles or Alexa, open Philadelphia Eagles and enjoy. Learn more at philadelphiaeagles.com slash voice.